We are recording. It's uh, it's uh, Richard and, and Andy in uh, solid colored shirts, collared even. Um, Andy, how are you doing? It's been a while. We're going up market, I think. We're, we're getting bigger, you see. Everything's going up. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Um, so I guess uh, since we been on last my biggest news is that I I dumped Facebook pro probably somewhat to your irritation because it's harder to much to my irritation much to your irritation <laughs> well you know um, yeah everybody can anyone can read my post on it I just it's not the first time I've, I've done it I did it um, you know back in 2013 or so and um, I reinitiated because I was living off grid in Mexico and I was, you know, I wanted a little bit more social contact and then it just, it snowballed and, you know, 17 bands. And I'm like, you know what, this is worth it for me. And, and plus I should be creating my own content such as well, ours here, even though it's on my YouTube channel. And, um, and then also, At some stage, Richard, you're going to get an, uh, an alcoholic drink and join me to say cheers. Um, no, no, what I, I was going to tell you is this is a, this is a, um, a Cronenberg, but um, Heineken, their son, the owner's son, used to go to my school. And on our last, actually my second last year, because he was the year above me, he let us drive a mini all the way to the Heineken factory and fill it up full of beers and come back and have a party. Uh. Okay. That's, that's my Heineken story. Yes, uh, Heineken's a Dutch beer, right? But who, you know, yeah. who knows where it's manufactured, right? Yeah, I've always liked Heineken. It's a, I, I tend to prefer lagers to ales, uh, yeah. in general, right? Now and then I like a, a stout or a porter. Um, I'm just a Guinness man these days. I, I really do just, you know, enjoy Guinness. I, I like it. I, I've always called it bread in a glass. Um, so why don't you rejoin Facebook? Maybe this is a, a plea. People can can comment afterwards, agreeing and and backing me up. You should join Facebook again. So this is the beginning uh, of it. Now, it's uh, you know I got to I've just got to move on from that. I I I am active, not super active, a little bit on Twitter, and that kind of culls my um or you know limits my um going off and everything it's spending way way too much time uh so we're gonna have a guest on anything else to to uh um to discuss before we uh before we do that the how's house life going for you how's the house going what's that how's uh i think uh well i i fired my broker because it just wasn't getting enough action and i got the top agent in town there's only three brokerages in in this small town and i got the top one uh over uh, three million in volume so far in this year three million ahead in volume in 2019 year to date than than the second place and the top five of the top ten are all from the same brokerage so i'm pretty happy they, they uh, about 12 agents toured the place yesterday. It's been on the mark on the market with a new uh, broker for less than tomorrow will be uh, seven days. And I've already had like three or four showings. I've had two offers. Um, yeah. So things are starting to move and I hope to be out of here uh, uh, soon and start the next phase. So I'm going to, uh, Andy, tell us what have you been cooking lately as I uh, get to, get George our meeting link out to him. Um, I did a bolognese the other day, uh, day before yesterday, I did a big set. I did um, no interesting meats. It was just um, pork sausage. Um, I did some lamb and then beef mince, 20% fat, high fat. I uh, started with the sofrito, which is um, carrots, onions, celery, and garlic. And then I put that in with a little bit of oil, put it in, and then put the tomato paste in, and then uh, browned the meat, in a, and then added the chopped tomatoes, then put it all together, and mm. you know, added whatever else, Worcester sauce, a um, couple of other things, a bit of butter, and then, yeah, then let it, let it cook out for a bit, put some stock in it with some water, give it, some, give it hours, and after about two and a half hours, I put some cream in, I put one single cream, a pot of single cream, Mm -hmm. and then 
let it go for another hour, uh, and then separate it a bit out, put it in a, in a pan, cook the pasta. So I've got the big pot with 80% of the food in, taken 20% out, put it in a pan, uh, added the pasta to the pan and a bit of the water, mixed it up and then served it in a sort of in a mixture rather than, you know, pasta with the meat on top in the traditional way. So that was that. Yeah, it sounds it sounds great. I I do like uh, I do like bolognese. Um, uh, when I lived in France, uh, I had a, uh, a girlfriend who did really excellent bolognese. It's it's something I really like. Um, I unfortunately um, uh, my cooking I haven't done any videos in in a while, and and my cooking kind of sucks. And for the simple reason that is is that I want to keep the the house in general and the kitchen in particular um, ready for a showing at yeah. any time because you know it's all it's very local here so I can get a call or a text from an agent and say <coughs> it's ready I'll be out of here in 15 minutes you know yeah. boom. and so you know I don't I, uh, uh, I could do it at night but that but it's just easier to just grill and all I have to yeah. have is a plate and a fork to Tell me something, off. Richard. Um, what does What's that I, say? I'm, I'm guessing it's Japanese. What does that say behind you to your right, right behind you on the wall? Uh, to, um, oh, no, that's, uh, oh, it's something my former wife put up. I've never even read it. So this will be the first time. Uh, to be at home is to find yourself with those who put your heart at ease. I guess that's true enough. It is provided you have a good household. Um, I, like your, I like your phrase "true enough." It's a pragmatic, pragmatic construction. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to send out the link here to George, and so he should be joining us. Tell, and, tell me about your meeting with George. Tell me about when you first met him at the conference. Uh, we're going to let's wait till he gets on because I want to see his uh, his reaction uh, to that. Um, that makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you don't know him. I don't know if you, I shouldn't. I shot you uh, the video he did with Noah, who we've had on on here, which I I'll, I guess I'll link because Noah is a former you know discussion um, alumni, and yes. uh, it's a really good interview he did with uh, he did with Noah. So you know, should he should be coming on any second here? Yeah. So you know, in terms of joining you for a uh, <coughs> a beer. I actually don't have any alcohol in the house right now, so I couldn't even if I wanted to. So, <laughs> oh, you're having a dry. You're, you're having a dry short period, are you? It's a, it's it's on and off, you know. Um, but I like to if I if I choose to drink, then I just go down and get like a pint of whiskey or something like that. I can, I polish that. Might as well, off. Might as well talk about that off in like a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well talk about a few guests that might come on, which are, for example, Yasuhiko, your friend. Yes. Um, he's a he's a philosopher. He's Japanese. Yes. And he's going to talk about a few different. What what what, what do you know him as being really knowledgeable on and interested in? Well, philosophy in general and philosophy of the minds from sort of a he's a very interesting dude because he was a he was a he was a Japanese you know Buddhist monk sort of thing and uh, came to the US. I believe this is like late 70s or maybe early 80s. And um, he, uh, his perspective is, is kind of a hybrid between Eastern and Western. He's very well versed not only in all the Eastern stuff, um, but also all of the, uh, all of the Western you know, philosophy. Um, Can I frame something for you, Richard, see how you like like the simplest thing, so it's obviously just a generalization, but which is Western philosophy as kind of engaging, which you could see as left, left hemisphere, like going towards finding a target and improving, and Eastern, Eastern um, philosophy being about detachment, which is sort of right hemisphere, which is sort of pull away from something and, and detach yourself. And that's, that's kind of a, an interesting model, the way, I don't know, something like that, what do you think? The, uh, you know, uh, I... All I all I can really do in that regard is um, kind of just give my general impressions of it. It's it's more I think um, Eastern is seems to me to be more um, introspective. Yeah, and um, you know, trying to 
I don't know, find yourself, whatever. I, I like the, I like one thing I, I really like about it, is, you know, and it, it's expressed in different ways. And I, and I think even there's some elements in Western philosophy that incorporate that. And that's the idea of yin and yang, you know, balance. So yeah, you have this thing and then this other thing kind of balances it. And it's actually, it's actually also um, um, somewhat of a, of a scientific um, principle, because, which, which, I, which is typically described as negative feedback, right? So you have these like processes. Falsification. What's that? Yeah. Falsification as well. Yeah, but, but, just, but also negative feedback. So even like a, a physical process, if you're talking physics, you know, or biology or chemistry, you know, you have these sort of like, they're, you, you can call them chain reactions, but only to a point where it's limited and then the other thing kicks in and pushes it back down. We even have these, we have these things with hormonal, our own hormonal systems in our, in our body um, where, you know, it'll produce. And then there's this other thing that comes in that, that is a, uh, an inhibitor, you know, yeah. so you're always getting these push pulls uh, back and forth so that you, I mean, even a nuclear explosion is only a chain reaction to a certain point, right? So, you know, right, yeah, right there, it chains and goes bigger and bigger, and bigger but then it peters out, you know, so that sort of thing. Yeah, I've been I've been big on balance at the moment. I mean, I think balance runs in every every philosopher's philosophy, really. Whether it's whether it's you know Hegel, uh, Hegel, uh -huh. the, uh, you know thesis and antithesis meets you know synthesis, or whether it's Goethe or Nietzsche, all of them. You know, in a way, what you're trying to do is balance your sleeping pattern, balance your temperature, balance your sociability, balance your alcohol intake. Do you know what I mean? You're trying to balance everything. Yeah. Right? It's like a, a thousand balances that you're constantly trying to work on. Um, I was talking to my friend about, he said to me, describe your philosophy, describe your, what's called modest vivendi, which means like way of living as if like I had a way, and he said, you know, and I just said, you know what, Jim, I can't do it because, well, he, no, he did, sorry, he didn't specifically ask me. I said to him, I can't explain it because it's constantly changing. And it's, it's not like I believe in anarcho-capitalism or I believe in, uh, ex-ism or proprietary, you know, I use these things as tools, but you said to me, like, how do I live? I just say, you know, watch how I act. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't articulate it in a, in a, in a book. I was thinking about this last night. It was interesting because, um, I, if, you know, if you were to go to my blog, free the animal.com and search on stuff, you, you find results for almost everything that you That's search. That's your blog? That's a really good blog. Anyway. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Yeah, you've never heard me mention it before, <laughs> you know. Um, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably sometime, you know, within the next few months, I'm gonna hit post number five thousand. Especially if I start ramping it up and 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 uh, you know, writing my bullshit there instead of like wasting time on Facebook. At least it stays there. I can refer to it later. Try to do that with Facebook posts. It's just a, a, a crazy disaster. Yeah, too many. Um, especially, I save, my, I save my Facebook posts. They're interesting. Really good conversations. I just press save. Yeah, um, I've done that. I have some. Um, the uh, but I was thinking about this uh, deal with um, with uh, philosophy because I've written a lot of a lot about that, you know, from a libertarian or anarcho-capitalist perspective, and even some about propertarianism, as you brought up, um, Kurt Doolittle's gig. Um, and I'm like, I was thinking, I was like, you know what? I don't have much to say about it all anymore. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I'll get this idea, but it's more, it's, it's more, it's more, way more, way more, politics or current events and you know how it may peripherally relate to philosophy but to just like it's just so much um mental masturbation to me now um and i, I don't mean that in a in a particularly derogatory way but it's kind of the same thing when i used to write a lot about 
diet and weight loss and stuff like this. It's like at a point you got to say, I got it. You know, now how about I just live, right? And so that's kind of where I'm at. And so where I intend to be going once I uh, leave this place, hopefully within the next month or so, um, I've been doing a lot of research on, you know, being a nomad, you know, <laughs> expat, stuff like that, trying to figure out where do I want to go. And, um, and I want to do that. And I want to, that's what I want to write about. Like it's real practical stuff. It's like here, here, you can go here and live with a, you know, in a decent one bedroom with AC and good Wi-Fi, great cafes around, good food, da, 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 da. And you're living for 1500 bucks a month. Now, yeah. if you, if you, or less, right. In some places like the hopping place, hopping place right now is Vietnam, like Saigon, Hanoi, uh, you know, uh, Ho Chi Minh city, former Saigon people. I guess people call it Saigon still. Um, and, uh, here's George coming on. Don't got the video on yet. It'll come. That's good. Yeah, so who do you know who's moved out there? Have you got friends who live out in Vietnam? Um, I have I have friends of friends that are nomads who have who've, you know spent lots of time in Thailand. I've spent lots of time in Thailand. You know, it totaled up you know a number of months, and uh, so George is probably trying to start sort his audio and and video. George, if you can hear me. Um, the settings should be in your lower left-hand corner to select the right audio source and, uh, and turn your video on and, and so on. So anyway, Andy and I will just continue chatting uh, while you work that out. Um, so where's the first place? Let's say your house sold, you know, Delta tomorrow. Where's the first place you'd fly to? Um, so uh, probably, Probably somewhere in Vietnam, but there's a there's a number of places and one thing that's interesting is because I speak French uh, There's areas that are like old uh, French colonial areas where there's a lot of French spoken So that might be an interesting thing to do Makes um, sense. So we'll see but there's always there's all sorts of possibilities, uh, you know uh, um, Having been in uh, in Warsaw, I'm interested in Eastern Russia. A lot of guys are going to Ukraine. Um, you know, Kurt lived in in Ukraine for some for a period of time. Incidentally, um, uh, we had chatted about getting Kurt on here again. I didn't never heard back from you on that. Yeah, so Kurt hasn't responded to my um, my Facebook uh, thing yet. So I'll wait on that and we can discuss that. I'll, I'll email you when he does. Yeah. Okay. All George, right. can you hear us yet? Oh, he clicked off. Okay, maybe he's uh, still sorting. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Zoom, if, if you're using it for the first time, it, it, remember when we had the um, professor from Ireland, Dr. Um, Dr. Casey. Dr. Casey. Yeah. Uh, he had a bit of issues with it, but he, he got it sorted. So um, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, pause the recording right now okay. and uh, we'll just wait to get George on and then we'll bring the recording back online. Oh, he's, he's, here. he's here again. Are you there, George? Is it pause now? Let me pause it here. Uh -huh. One, two, three. All we're right. <laughs> we were gone for like 10,000 years and we're back. It was a time warp thing and, and, uh, uh, I'm Richard Nikolai and Andy Kerr's on just to bring and and George has never met Andy Andy's over in London and this is George Bruno who we have on and I just want to before I have him I want to so I, I want to give just a brief background of why it's such a treat for me to have him on and that is um, so I don't know it was a, a year or so ago he started um, working with uh, Anthony Johnson's 21 uh, studios 21 convention which I've spoken at four times and I started watching these interviews that he does with the speakers and, and sometimes some other folks as well and I'm like yeah I really like his interview style you know 
And uh, Ben, it was a, it, when I spoke at, in Warsaw um, at the 21 convention uh, just a couple months ago in July, it was like a great proof. So, so I did it like an hour long presentation and immediately went right down into the other room and where I was uh, interviewed by, by George and, and I was able to express what, what a privilege it was to, to actually be interviewed by someone that you admire such so much as an interview, but there's more to George too. So he's, so I'm going to frame it like this when, especially when I met him in person and saw him interact with people and do these interviews and just seeing him at breakfast even, you know, and then seeing him, he had a, he had a, um, um, a friend. Uh, I think that's the proper way to frame it at that point that he had been chatting with online, a, a woman friend, a, a, a Polish woman, very, very attractive and how he interacted with her and strolled along the sidewalk. And I'm like, I'm like, I got it. You remember the Dos Equis commercials way back on the radio and uh, on, on TV, the most interesting man in the world. And that's, that's who George reminds me of. So with that, with that, now you tell, you tell us about yourself, George. Well, uh, content creator currently, which means I'm also a citizen journalist, documentary maker, and overall just curious, person that likes to put things on video. And uh, in another life, I was a therapist for 22 years. I am trained, went to grad school, written books, had a great first career, got burned out, went to my family trade of cutting hair, which is what I do part time right now. And I thoroughly enjoy it. And uh, so, and you grew you groom beards as well, correct? Yes, yes, yeah. That's I became uh, the top. It's kind of funny how this turned out. There's a word, you know how there's words that exist now that didn't exist a hundred years ago. I became a beardsmith. <laughs> it's just kind of a a made up word, but I've I have shaped over um, twelve thousand beards, and I attract uh, bearded men from 27 states and eight countries that come and sit in my chair that I very passionately call the chill chair and give them haircuts or shape their beards. And a lot of guys put time into these, these things on their face. Uh -huh. And they, beards are a source of great anxiety as well as hair for men. And if you can help them relieve that anxiety, um, they will swim shark infested waters mm -hmm. to come see you. And that's basically uh, what I've done. But the, the, ch the chill chair really is a, uh, let me put it this way. When I used to do therapy, I would sit in front of the person's chair and talk to them face to face. Now I'm behind the chair cutting their hair. It's the same kind of work, except I got scissors in my hands. Yeah. And, uh, George, isn't it quite funny how um, we think of we think of that in culturally, especially in America, as far as I know, you know, of people talking to their hairdressers as yes. well as their paper. So it's yeah, and it yeah, just, that can you, that's why you can't, that's why you tend to want to go to a hairdresser or barber that you that you know and like because sometimes they can annoy the hell out of you if they are yeah. talking your ear off, you know, and you're yeah. And you and you're not really into the, their whatever their conversational interests or or uh, or whatever. A, a quick story. Actually, I told this story um, uh, when our last discussions, George, and um, I think it's appropriate to repeat it here. Uh, so when we came, I had I had, you know I my hair was quite longer when when we were in yeah. Poland, and I did that hike in um, in the in the southern Spain and the brutal heat and everything. Yeah. And by the time I got back, I was like, man, I'm really tired of this. I, I, I want to get it cut off. So the, the local barber who had taken it from the long that it was to where it was when I saw you, his shop was closed. So I went down to someone I know, uh, Colleen's shop, you know. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a female stylish place. 
that I go in there and she's like, and she, she only had one person in there. She says, go ahead and sit down, Richard. I'll, I'll take care of you. Right. She's like, what do you want? I said, just shave it all off, you know, buzz cut it. And she goes, no. <laughs> I said, okay, then do what you want. <laughs> so, that's so, good. That's pretty good. Right. And I, I was happy with it. I've been happy with it. So I'm going to hey, go. I, I, I've given four bad haircuts in my lifetime. Uh -huh. And all four of those things have one thing in common. I gave the customer exactly what they wanted. <laughs> George, when I, so every haircut I've had since I was about 16, so I'm 33, so in 17 years, every haircut I've had, when I go in, I say to the hairdresser, I had this haircut two days ago, and I say, do what you want and you think looks best. And I, it's every single time, that's what I do. And, it, and you know, you get varying results, but, but yeah. So, yeah. My stuff. Yeah. Good. Okay. We're, 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 in, Actually, we're in agreement. We're in agreement that the hairdresser is in charge. You know, you sit. You sit down. Can I, right there. Ask, you, can I ask you a question? Just because you've had so much um, experience in therapy, what's your uh, what's your view on the work that not so much the evangelical stuff, but more the practical uh, uses that, and this sort of existential stuff from Jordan Peterson? I think uh, his voice is important. I think um, he initiates conversation and dialogue like no one else. He's a phenomenon because he got a lot of people talking about things that no one else was able to <coughs> generate conversation. If I follow all of his stuff to its logical conclusion, I'm not a fan of it. What I'm a fan of is how he generated the conversation and the quote unquote, like for instance, I, you know, two years ago, I said there would be no Jordan Peterson if there was not a great publicist. And I lost 5,000 Twitter followers in, in about two hours and literally 5,000 people stopped following me because I know the power of publicity. I know the power of PR almost better than anyone else. Uh, in my circles. And one thing I know to be true is that his message is not really unique, but he has the power of publicity behind him. CAA represents some massive names. He was at, at the point where the most expensive tickets, like just like the house general admission tickets were $45, the expensive tickets, if you went to see him in a theater, you know, during one of his lectures, were about $200. Those $200 tickets were being scalped out on the sidewalk for $1,000, $1,200, $1,500. Wow. And, of course, that was played up by, by the publicist. It might have happened once or twice. I don't know. But, you know, publicists are great at positioning people for success. And I do believe his, his agent played a huge role in what we know today as Jordan Peterson. Huh. I think, I think the, way I, why, the, the way I heard about him is the way that maybe a few million people heard about him was Joe, uh, Joe Rogan in, I think it was September 17, the first one. Yeah. And I listened to the first 20 minutes about uh, pronouns and all that sort of stuff. And I was about to turn off. I thought, yeah, okay, I've got it. I've got, I've got the spiel. I've got the whole you know, Zer and all that stuff. And I've got Jordan Peterson's view. And I was, I was just thinking, okay, well, I'll, I'll, and, and I thought, no, I'll just watch a bit more. And by the end of it, I was as transfixed by it as Joe Rogan was, as millions of other people were, because, you know, I'm, I'm partly an intellectualist and I like to think about things as well as a practitioner of, of, of things. And I think he presented so many things that, that clicked into place and he looked at so many things. And I just thought, ah, it's, Anyway, he's, he's definitely a phenom. He's definitely a, someone to look out for. But I'm also at the stage now where everything I see of his is a repetition. So it's sort of like I want to see him grow. It's almost like I want to see him go away. Exactly. Then, exactly where I'm at. It, it, it interfaces with our prior conversation about, you know, uh, uh, my interest in, in, you know, philosophy from a sort of libertarian Yeah, there, there would be no Jordan Peterson if there wasn't a... Joseph Campbell. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's where he goes a bit far for me, but there we go. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, the thing is, is, is I'm, I, I was echoing what Andy said. It's like, it's like, and I read the book, the 12 steps or most of it anyway. And it's like, and you know, it's a phenomenon. So you want to be, you want to at least be somewhat uh, conversant on him. If, if, uh, if you're if, if chatting with people on intellectual levels, he's going to, his name's going to come up. Right. So it's good to have a, a, an overview, but it's just like the philosophy we're to Andy and I were talking about before you came on George. And, and also, um, my past blogging for a long time about, you know, the paleo diet and all that stuff and food and everything. It's at where, at what point do you say, I've got it. It's, it's, I've got enough. I, I, I can live, I can function. And let's, let me go out and test these ideas in practical ways. Reality. I want to get into, into some of that uh, stuff. I would push back against that very slightly and say that once you've gone through that, those years of reading philosophy or over intellectualizing everything or armchair philosophizing, then you want to get practical and everything's about what can I do today? What can I do for my friends and my family? All of this stuff. And I think I've kind of reverted back and I've said, okay, well, I don't want to become ultra, ultra practical. And I, I still want to sort of keep tweaking. I never want to ossify the way that I live and always trying to keep take new information. And it's sort of like, it's easier the older we get to mm -hmm. ossify by not uh, sort of trying to change and trying to adapt with the times. George? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think about every generation, a voice comes along that teaches us the basics. And honestly, you know, clean your room and make your bed uh, has almost become like a uh, kind of a tongue in cheek thing. You know, yeah. all right. So, all right. So I cleaned my room. Now, where are the women? In, in, in other words, it's attained metaphorical status, you know. Well, exactly. Exactly. It's kind of I like, mean, it's, kind, it's of like kind, kind of like this thing I have on my note here that I'm going to talk to you later. Get unstuck. Kind yeah. of. Right. It's a, yeah. You have a website uh, that's called that. But before we do that, let's let's talk about the art of the interview. And I'm going to drop some links and George has it. You have, how many YouTube subscribers do you have? 137,000 something. That's substantial. Yeah. yeah. So uh, George does, George does a lot of content in, in, on video on various subjects. And I'm not sure that you, do you have interviews that you've done on, on your YouTube or are those all on 21 sites? Yeah, I've done, I've done a lot of different interviews. I just, I just call them uh, dialogues. I like having conversations with people. Yeah. and uh, we that's why we call this discussions and Andy, and I, yeah. Andy yeah. and I I call this discussions you know discussions one yeah. discussions two discussions three but there is room for the uh, for the interview and there's the there's uh, and it's kind of all because sometimes it sounds like an interview then sometimes it sounds like a conversation sometimes it sounds like a, a discussion and, and one thing that really surprised me I mean, it's like, oh, you were wrong on that one, Richard. Because I started seeing all of this long form stuff come out, you know, like Rogan, like Dave Rubin, these guys, the, it, it can be an hour, it can be two, there's like no fixed end to it. They just go and go and go, especially Rogan. I mean, I, some of them go over three, I think it's one on with Alex Jones. Four hours with four Sam Harris. Hours. What? Four hours with Sam Harris, four and a half yeah, and minutes. I was like, I was like, with the shortest tension spans we have, uh, it, because there's so much information flow, right? How can this possibly work? But it appears that there is, it appears that there's quite a, um, quite an appetite for, or, or look at uh, Stefan Molyneux. You know, I, I, I said for years, I said, I can't watch his videos, they're too long. You know, there's, two hours of the truth about this or the truth but about But is that saying more about you than it is about someone else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll, I'll get you back on that, Abby. So, um, but, so, George, the, the, how about just interview art? You and I talked about some, some who, are, who are some of the interview personalities that, you've, uh, that you admire or that you like to watch or that you've actually learned from and developed some some techniques from well bill moyers is one of my favorites he's a, a pbs fella and uh when he did 
his interviews with Joseph Campbell on mythology that made such an impact on me. Uh, that was probably about three decades ago. But I like Bill Moyers. I've always liked Dick Cavett. There's something about Dick Cavett's voice. He could he could say anything and just... My favorite interview ever, George, uh, is Dick Cavett with Marlon Brando. Yes. One of, the best, one of the best interviews ever. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. And we, you, when we were in Poland, George, we talked about Terry Gross, you know, Fresh Air yes. Yes. On, uh, on NPR. And I, now, sometimes, here's the thing with her, is even, because, you know, she, she does a wide range of human interest stuff, you know, like music or books and, and things like this. But I found that even if I wasn't particularly interested in the subject matter, I, just, I was just delighted with the way she just weaved in and out with the thing. So, so one of my favorite interviews is her interviewing Keith Richards. Yeah. It's the, it's on the NPR uh, uh, archive site. It's just brilliant, and it, partly because Keith Richards is an incredibly interesting dude, and and he goes, he talks about how he one of the just greatest sections of the interview. He talks about how he got. He was kind of the idea man for the songs, and then and then Mick is who would make it into a to a song, right? But uh, uh, Keith talked about how he would come up with ideas. He used he had a, one of those old cassette recorders, you know, the flip top with the buttons and everything, and he just get a riff and like in a hotel room, and you know. A lot of people, I, I think most everybody has this problem where you got you have these ideas and it's like, maybe there's something to that, right? Maybe you're a little bit inebriated at the time and, and you're, everything's firing, you got this great idea, right? And then the next day you can't remember what it is, but not Keith Richards. He would put on the record and pop it out. It could be ridiculous, but at least he would have, he would have saved it and it could be something he, uh, he would, uh, uh, do you know later? I mean, I when a lot was, of those bands, Richard, have a have a sort of a specialization that we don't see. Like Mick Jagger was obviously like stagecraft. He was all about. There's a there's a live version I think seventy three of uh, Beast of Burden, which is kind yeah. of a, it's an alright tune, but it is such a good version because he's just the way he plays, the way he moves around, and oh, it's. Just, and I think the the Beatles, the Beatles played for years on street corners in Liverpool, and each one of them took a sort of uh, took um, they in their own areas and they allowed for the Beatles to become how it was obviously with a lot of backing um, yeah I think bands bands are fascinating the way they come through like the band uh, yeah. so Robbie Robertson in the band he wrote all the music and he got all the money and they all got sort of they were all in destitute yeah and he ended up with all, but it, you know and that tension runs through them as so the band had a um, their big I think it was 73 it was no 78 they were um, their final gig was filmed by the um, What's his name? The director. Martin Scorsese, The Last Waltz. Scorsese, absolutely, absolutely. And it, it's, it's so interesting to me. Some, that's some of the absolute best live music I've ever seen. I really, it blew me away, like uh, Caravan. Caravan. Are you talking when about Caravan that movie? Walks off stage. You're talking about that movie that uh, Scorsese, uh, was that Scorsese that did that about the Rolling Stones a few years back? No, uh, it, it was about the band, a band called The Band. Oh, okay. Anyway, I, I'm really interested in the history of uh, bands and how they sort of, it's from maybe sort of early 60s to let's say late 70s, sort of 60s and 70s. Yeah, yeah. Now, George, what, when you, so any, any other favorite interviews, any, or, or interviewers that, uh, that listeners should check out? I, I am of the persuasion that interviewers need to be friends with the person that they're interviewing. Uh -huh. and, I, and I say that because that makes you want to build a bridge to them as quickly as possible. Like for instance, President Trump, we are at, uh, at odds with China right now. Let's, let, I mean, they're a superpower. They would be considered our enemy, so to speak. President Trump says, my friend, President Xi. Uh -huh. And I thought, why is he saying that? Some people said, he's a traitor. And somebody pointed out to me and said, it's easier to negotiate with a friend than with an enemy. Mm -hmm. I 
thought that's freaking brilliant. Make friends with them. Even if you don't agree, make friends. So when I interview people, I like to feel like I'm having a conversation with a friend and it does come across like that. It, it's never uh, an interrogation. It's never a gotcha. I never try to corner anybody. I want to bring the best out of people. And I ask questions, make comments, and then I just zip it. Yeah. So what you're saying, so what you're saying, George, is, and I'm using that as a lead into that because um, I'm going to do two. I'm going to show two opposite examples here. So the, everyone's probably has seen the the Kathy Newman interview of Jordan Peterson. It's ridiculous where she, where everything he she, he says, she's like, so what you're saying is, and he says, no, that's not at all what I'm saying. So what you think, but. So that's the that's that's the antagonistic gotcha sort of you know yeah. keep you on the run sort of interview. It's boring. It's it's just it it makes you feel like you have to take a shower after you've seen yeah. it, right? It's just yeah. so much garbage most of the time, and that that happens both of the ways. That's why I don't watch any of this cable news. All these like sound bites and like you know da 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 da, da and 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 I just hate it. Um, same with talk radio. Um, except, you know, Rush is okay because normally he has on, you know, ditto heads. And so, you know, it's, it's more of a congenial conversation than, than, than an adversarial one. But here is a great example of what you're saying about friends. You know, Piers Morgan is, is quite a lefty, you know, liberal lefty, but he so happens to be good friends with Donald Trump for a long time. Right. And when Trump was just in the UK, Piers Morgan was the one who got the call for like an, an hour long interview. And it's a brilliant interview because they're friends. And so there was so you, you learned it was much more about common grounds than it was about. I got you with this. I got you with that. Perfect example, George. Thank That's you. A good point. Yeah. Go. I used to work in a salon where the owner of the salon would refer to all the new customers as a friend. This is probably 40 years ago. And I'll never forget as the person was ringing out and paying for their services and leaving, uh, the owner would say, it's good to see you again, my friend. Mm -hmm. It's good to see you. And he would, he would always use that terminology. And I believe that that, unconsciously disarms people to believing that they're actually a friend. Now yeah. it might be psychological manipulation, but I don't care. It works. I think it, it creates a little more peace it's and beneficial. a little more it's beneficial psychological manipulation. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Well, it's, absolutely. it does. It's, you know, and there's, there's countries you can go to and cultures where you get greeted at the door of like a restaurant or something. It's like, like, Come in, my friend. Come in, my friend. You know, and it's just it's 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 it really puts puts people on a good um, um, good setting for whatever it is they're trying to mutually accomplish. You know, whether it's to buy some goods or 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 something like that. You know, and then I suppose that could lead to sitting down and smoking pipes together, right? That's something I. Forgot to mention is that uh, yeah. you're rather a pipe of smoking aficionado. I think I think uh, Ant I heard Anthony Johnson one time introduce you as a professional pipe smoker. <laughs> I wish I could get paid for pipe smoking. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be a millionaire. I've always said that uh, two men can sit down and smoke pipes and not say a word, and after an hour get up, shake hands, and each go their separate ways. And uh, the wives or girlfriends would say, oh, so how'd it go tonight? <laughs> Fantastic. We had, it was, we had a, I had a great night. Yeah. Because men, men don't have to have chatter back and forth yeah. uh, in order to have a good time. They can just comment on things and, and <laughs> slowly puff on a cigar or a pipe. And it just, there's a camaraderie that happens. I yeah, feel the same yeah. way about about you as that, George. When uh, in Pulp Fiction, when uh, what's his name, John Travolta sits opposite Uma Thurman in the car, 
And yeah. he says, one of my favorite things is sitting opposite someone and not having to say anything. That's the moment I always think of. And yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's definitely a male, female thing. Very few, very few uh, women I know can do that. Or, or they would just get, it's that sort of awkwardness. They, you know, that sort of the young teenage phrase, they go, oh, orcs, that's orcs. Everything's awkward. I think that's, a, that's quite a, a female um, kind yeah. of stance on things. You know? Yeah. The, uh, I mean, you know, it was, it's funny, you know, um, with, my, uh, with my former wife, um, I don't like to use the word ex-wife. It's weird to me. We both say for, former wife, former husband. Anyway, um, I like uh, but it's, it was always funny. You know, I'd say, hey, I talked to Dave, my brother, or Stacy, or Michael, or I talked to my dad, or I talked to my mom. And then I get these lists of like, well, how's this going? How's this going? You know, things in their lives. How's this going? Let's, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't ask. She's like, you didn't ask. <laughs> yeah we we don't um men and women are different yes. you know and we and, and we should celebrate those differences i mean i you get all these these people that are on dating sites and, and they're looking for uh you know people that are exactly like them and i'm thinking god i i don't want another me you know, in the same car, same room. I want to have something different. And, oh. you know, I like the idea that we're different. I like the concept. Yeah. I think it's, it just makes for an interesting relationship. Oh, man, it would be awful, right? Wouldn't it? Um, yeah. So do we have anything more to talk about in terms of interview art or the art of the interview? What? I got well, one. I think I, it's I, my position. Can, can I ask you a couple of questions? Like, yeah. what... What are some big no's? Maybe you've got some things, ah, I really don't like that style because of this. I really don't like, when you're doing this, maybe not that, you know, any, anything like that, any prescriptions? It's better to have silence than use a filler word, such as um, or the long, so what do you think, you know, people will, basically it's, it, what it, it's about cognition. It's better to have silence because you will get an odd, like for instance, when I'm on stage, speaking there's times where i will say something and then have complete silence and i'm looking in the crowd and after about seven seconds every eye is on me and that's when i can deliver a gem of truth that i know will stick so it's strategic silence so keep that in mind that that's a big deal the other thing is let the person talk let the person i think one of the things that i have done in all of my journalism is I let people, I let people tell their story. And that's the key. Let people tell their story. It, it might be the George Bruno show, but when I have a conversation or an interview with somebody, it is their show. Mm. Um, on the subject of silence, now, I, I don't know that I've ever done this in a in a face to face negotiation, or I suppose you could do on on video, and um, but it's a great telephone technique when it's just vo voice. Because I used to negotiate some some pretty substantial deals for business on behalf of uh, businesses debtors in essence to settle some financial claim. Um, <clears throat> And so, the, just a fabulous technique. So you, so you chat for a while and you kind of read, kind of read where things are going and everything. And then you bring in your offer. You don't justify it. It's just the offer. Here's what it is. And then you don't say anything. <laughs> and if, no matter what, I've had, Pauses go. On. I've had pauses go on for thirty seconds, a minute, before the. I see. I see the people on stage, yeah, uh, Richard, who um, who talk about being scared of silence. I say it's always longer to the person talking. So you can stay. You can say, come to the end of something instead of saying um or linking it. You just stop, and then you move on, and you can rewatch it. And that three four seconds that felt like twenty was three or four seconds, yeah. and it's. It's, it's the same in an interview. It's the same in a, in a discussion, in an interview, in a conversation. 
when someone asks you a difficult question, take those 10 seconds that feel like two minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, the other, and especially even, and I would say on video too, you do, you have, you do both verbal silence and body silence, no body language, you know, poker face in essence, you know, while you're thinking. Um, so is, you know, not, it's not like you're not giving off the signal. It's like, hmm, uh, uh, you know, stuff like that. That would, that would, that just popped into my mind. So George, how does one get unstuck? He, he has a, I'm going to link all this stuff up, including his YouTube channel. Um, also, George, I'm going to make this when I get this file processed after we finish, I'm going to make it available to you in case you want to pop it, pop it up on your YouTube yeah. Channel in case it's up to you. Uh, yes, I would love to. Um, so, how do we get? I really like that getting unstuck, and and we sh you should follow George on Twitter as well, um, uh, because he he gives out these little grains of uh, grains of truth that I think can be what. Ha so you deal mostly with men. Um, Single or married or both? Everything. Every, yeah. every age, every status. Yeah. What are men most stuck in? Income. In number one. Number two, relationships. And those two are really tied together very closely. I have found that men that are happy in relationships can give all of their psychic and mental energy to their jobs, to their income, to creativity. And I find that, like for instance, when I was married, you know, I had, I had done some part-time acting for about five years. And I remember going to an audition, having to be at an audition in, in Philadelphia. I live four miles outside of Philly. And that morning, I have to remain focused. I don't have any TV on, any radio, because I know I was going to have to do a read in front of a casting director. And I wanted to be mentally prepared. So I'm just kind of zenning out in the morning. And then the wife would say something that would be, could possibly start an argument. And I would get bent out of shape and I, I would end up leaving the house with that on my mind when five minutes ago it was on giving the best possible audition. And I found that when I went to an audition after just having an argument at home that I always lost the role. It was just a waste of time. And I thought to myself, there's a relationship between happiness at home and my performance outside the home uh -huh. across yeah. the board. Now, auditioning for a role in a commercial is a very specific example, but I, could, I would say that that applies all across life. Your happiness at home affects how you conduct your business, the yeah. income that you make, the meetings that you have, I'm as happy, I've never been happier in my life than right now. I'm, I'm very content. And it's a choice. And I have uh, closed certain doors and opened certain doors to various people. It's almost like regulating, regulating sound on an equalizer, you know, uh, shaping a sound I'm, I've shaped such a great life by minimizing certain tones and accentuating other tones in my life and I'm killing it everywhere I go I'm closing deals boom 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 left and right mm -hmm. for, for months now months and it's as if the ballast has been cut off like a hot air balloon you get rid of the sandbags and the balloon rises and I have nothing holding me back. Nothing. What's and it's the, a great place to be. What's the what's the biggest what's the biggest financial mistakes 
men are making beyond main beyond trying to keep a good relationship going or or not do any anything about a bad one um what are what are what are the what are the financial mistakes that you find that men are making bleeding online bleeding at work um not delaying their emotions i always tell people all the time do not don't don't deny your emotions but delay them i don't want you to be a cold stone or a, what they call a stone cold prick you know mm. what i mean you I, that's not a good thing you want you want to remain remain uh flexible and have a permeable heart a semi-permeable heart that lets love out and that can also receive love if you are just cold and robotic about life and about relationships and about the nature of women and the nature of this and the nature of that and you get very dogmatic about many things there's a stiffness that comes across in your deal making and i find that that's the result of men denying their emotions and it gets bottled up and it comes out as an awkwardness a social awkwardness a uh, awkwardness in meetings an awkwardness in face to face conversation and i like to tell people to you know wait wait till a safer time to be angry or cry or be pissed off or whatever you well, don't have to carry that with you and have this free floating grief or a free floating anger in your mind because other people are going to pick up on it and nobody there, wants to do business with someone who is like that mm -hmm. there used to be a um, fairly common saying i don't hear it much anymore but the old advice to sleep on it yeah yeah you know and that can that can work for not only if you if you find your if you find negative emotions or sometimes even to it you know over exuberance like oh I gotta you know oh that's cool I'm gonna go get online and buy that right well you're being emotional you're making it's really appealing to you and rather than like thinking about but it, it can also be for business decisions um, I had a uh, I. Uh, in a, in what in my past life, I used to speak at some conferences, uh, uh, business conferences, and I had a I had a presentation that I called the virtue of procrastination, and uh, it goes kind of like that in terms of, you know, if you have some idea, particularly a business or entrepreneurial idea, you know, people are like, well, write everything down and da 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 da, and start taking break it down, start taking actions, and da 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 But I think step number one should be procrastinate. Because by the time, either, if you do that, either something's just gonna work in your subconscious and you're gonna say, nah, that's never gonna work, you know, blah, blah, blah. I did, and I didn't waste any time or money on it. But even if you do execute on it, I guarantee you that the way you execute it a month or two or three months down the road is going to be quite different than had you at the beginning. And most likely you're going to do it more efficiently and at yeah. less cost. Yeah. Think about that. I, re I remember wanting to quit a job. I was uh -huh. in my twenties and I went to a, a pastor asking him what I should do. And this, and this advice I take with me and I now give this advice. Uh, when I speak to people, he said, write your letter of resignation, stick it in an envelope, seal that envelope, put it in your top drawer on your desk. Wait three weeks. Put it on your calendar after three weeks, take that out, open it, look at the letter. If you still feel the same way that you want to resign, submit the letter. He says, but most likely you won't want to resign. Uh -huh. I'll bet you that holds true a lot of the time. Andy? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's just not, not rushing into decisions, isn't it? Um, I'm, I, try and, I, try and frame, I try and frame it a little bit differently. Uh, I mean, Richard, what do you think about that? I want to respond to your response on that. In what way, specifically? Uh, not, can you? 
your response to my response. Refresh me here. Well, on, on what George was talking about, were you, were you listening? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that. I thought you meant something that, that I was saying. I, I, my response is that, is, that, is that that, you know, trick, and it could be a resignation level. It's just an example. It could be, it's going to be like, I'm going to tell my wife, I'm going to get, I want a divorce, and here's why. You write out all the reasons, seal it up, wait three weeks. It's an innumerable, and I'm, I'm bet, what, here's the thing I'm, I'm positive about, is that 99% of the time, even if you, even if you decide to move forward, your pr approach, you're going to rewrite that letter. You're going to edit it. You're going to craft it a little bit better because you've had time for everything to, to settle out. But all of these things we're talking about are, are, are very, they're just, they're different approaches to the same sort of thing. Sleep on it. Don't rush in. Delay, yep. especially when you know you're being emotional, is delay it, right? Let those emotions churn, you know, into whatever they're going to concoct. So our um, pilot version of this was with a guy called Morris Beerling, and he uh, came to England. I'd never met him when we had the chat on here a few months ago. And he came to Putney, right down the road, and went to the pub, and had we both had a Guinness each, and chatted about um, business and opportunities and, and his way of, uh, you know, he's only 25, 26, I mean, he's a young yeah. guy. Yeah, man. And um, as we were walking back just outside to my house, he said to me, the thing that's taken him through the last year and t turned him from sort of a, not a university dropout, but someone who's sort of a fledgling kind of a hopeful entrepreneur into someone who's actually now succeeding. And on that, you know, that Pareto distribution kind of rise, um, was not carrying his burdens with him at every moment, almost like deliberately saying this issue, you know, I've got a problem with my girlfriend, or with my this or my, you know, this. And taking it and either writing it down or, 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 or tabling it or you know parking it really deliberately training himself over time to not carry that with him so he's always free and always able to, to deal with the moment I think that, that and I said goodbye to him and I stood outside and as I was fumbling for my keys I, um, I thought about it and it really hit me hard I don't know what you think about that George yeah you know Delay, don't deny. Mm -hmm. Just just that alone right there. I mean, that's gold. Absolute um, gold. Andy, in terms of more, it's, 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 uh, it's interesting. The very first time I, I had a Zoom, you know, we were, we, were, we were, you know, messaging on Facebook. He's like, hey, you want to have a video chat? And he goes into Zoom, right? We're just having a casual conversation, right? But he's like, he's taking notes. Of, of just a conversation with another guy. We weren't talking about anything yeah. specific. And he even shared the notes with me, right? Yeah. That he was doing. You know, you can share screens on Zoom and everything. And I thought, that's kind of good. That's kind of like Keith Richards with the thing. It's like, okay, put it down. I'll get to it later, but you're not, yeah. right? You're, you're setting this aside. I thought it's a, it's a, it's a, it, I, I figure that's probably too high of a level of discipline for me personally, but, uh, but I will sometimes at night, what, what I'll do is I'll have some idea and I'm like, I think about it for a few seconds. And I think, you know what? I want to revisit this later. Maybe I've had a few cocktails or something like that. Who knows? This could be total bullshit or maybe it's some, some insight from inebriation. And so what I'll do is I'll pick up my phone and I'll send an email to myself, right? With just a little yeah. note so that I know I'm going to see it in a day or two when I review my inbox. Well, what, what do you think about this, Richard and George? Um, I, let's call it the soundbite of uh, wisdom through conversation. And it's the idea that, you know, what we're doing now is we're talking to you, George, and you, you know, we'll rewatch this and learn some things. Talk to Moritz and I met him. So let's take Joe Rogan as a, a single person. If you look at the first four or five Joe Rogans, he's talking about, they're laughing and joking. It's almost like they're on stage. It's a bit of a show. It's a joke. And then you go months ahead and it's almost like you, you can you can miss out let's say a hundred each time and now he's this really articulate conversation i'm not saying perfect i'm not saying i'm a huge fan i'm just saying definitely improved and i think that i look at him as a um 
almost like a model so for Richard and I to, to try and each time try and think, okay, well, that wasn't good. That was better. What do you think of Joe Rogan's style, George? I like it. He's very watchable. Uh, he's, it, it's so, it's so different than anything you usually see on television or hear on the radio because there's not in the States, there's not the uh, FCC monitoring everything and you don't have to bleep out bad words. And we all know that some people, most people use profanity on a fairly regular basis and it doesn't fade He's us, and uh, I think when you take away those kind of boundaries, it just lets people be real. Mm -hmm. And I find him to not, he's not antagonistic. He, I think he, um, he does challenge people appropriately, I think. But I think overall, I've never seen him create an enemy on his show so it's his style and I think um, he has uh, he's not trying to be anything like for instance if I saw him out on the street I have a hunch that he would be exactly like he is on his show yeah. whereas television and radio shows there's a there's a way of talking on TV. Smarminess. There's a horrible smarminess, isn't there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that news reporter, news anchor kind of thing. Faux like authority I've, figure. Yeah, yeah. And I've recently uh, befriended Anna Breeze, a former journalist with the BBC. And she and I uh, have gone back and forth pretty nicely. She's starting her own media company, and she's teaching people that you are a journalist and a reporter with your cell phone. You don't need cameras. You don't need lights. You don't need microphones. You don't need the backing of a state-sponsored media organization. You are your own media organization. And that's what she's teaching people. Good. Uh, so she's watching some of my videos, and uh, she's a fan of my interviews. And... Uh, uh, actually, just this morning, I proposed to her that we do some type of collaboration. Yeah, but she's she's well known in the UK. The um, the you know the 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 barrier to entry is is nothing. I mean, it's 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 equivalent to um, to you know a, a fine wine or champagne or maker or whiskey distiller. Yep. You know, versus someone who can just go to the tap now and you know get a get get a glass of water. That's that's right. You know, the the news with the um, you know the big the vans with the big pole that goes up mi microwave. All this stuff is it's millions. Of do you know, and broadcasters broadcast equipment, antennas, and all this stuff. It's millions of dollars, and you got a guy like I don't watch him on YouTube. I think he's the top guy, PewDiePie or something like that. A hundred million, a hundred subscribers, a hundred million. There will, million. There will never be another PewDiePie. What's that? It, What's he's number one on YouTube. Is it's PewDiePie? Is is he's like a Swedish guy? I think. So he he t he started out by doing he was gaming stuff, right? Making videos about gaming and stuff. But now it's a little bit more current events and so on and. And um, I guess he makes tons of money because it, with that kind of, you know, I don't imagine every video gets a hundred million views, but probably every video gets at least a few million views. And, um, and you know, you show an ads, you know, he's, he's, he's had 23.3 billion views. What's that? 23.3 that billion views. Yeah. Overall. That's mind boggling. I mean, he's, he's bigger. He's bigger than CNN. He's bigger than Fox. I thought you were going to say bigger than Jesus there. I'm sorry, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and these, these, so like a media company like Fox, CNN, or MSNBC, da, 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 they got these enormous salaries, contract, salary contracts. Um, they've got enormous, um, um, you know, overhead in terms of their, you know, 
productions and everything because they have a whole team and all this stuff. And you get a guy who can sit there like 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 you or I and generate a hundred million fans and hit and at the cost of an eighty dollar internet connection and a and a few thousand for a computer. <laughs> it's, amazing. It's it's really amazing. George, on the on the finances on on finances for, for the men you consult. Um <clears throat> What's a what's a what's a rule of thumb or two or three? I was thinking, um, you know, rule number one is is always live below your means. Always, no exceptions. What do you think of that? My whole thing is this: um, don't you can't scrimp your way. You know, they say, well, stop. You know, look how much you spend on a cup of coffee every day, mm -hmm. five days a week. That money could go into savings and, you know, stop going to Starbucks. And I, my thing is you can't un-Starbucks your way to wealth. Uh -huh. you, you can't, you can't scrimp your way to wealth. What you need to do is create more profit centers, not, not just close off little areas that you're rewarding yourself. I like going and buying a cup of coffee somewhere or my latest thing is a matcha latte. I'm enjoying it. I don't want to make it at home. I want to go out where they make it for me and I enjoy that. And it costs four to five bucks to get it and and I'm perfectly okay with that. And, and, you, and can, I, you, can, you can sit there on your laptop and, and, and punch out an outline for another chapter in the book you're writing or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a household where when you walk out of a room, you turn out the light, yeah. and uh, you if you help if you're holding the refrigerator door open too long while you're looking for stuff, yeah. you know, or you know, close the door. What are you trying to heat the outside, or yeah. you know, what do you live in a barn and all this kind of stuff? And it was this this, uh, <clears throat> and I understand that. Uh, I understand parents that went through the depression or had parents that went through to, through, you know, the depression and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I get that, but I think a lot of those old attitudes just get passed on it. You know, it's the story of, you know, the boy watching his, uh, watching his mother. I think Zig Ziglar told the story watching his mother cut off the end of a ham bone before she put it in the uh, oven for dinner. And the boy said, why do you, why do you cut that off? She, she says, well, that's the way grandma used to do it. And uh, so grandma was in the other room and the little boy went in there and said, why do you cut the bone off the ham before you, before you bake it? And she said, well, that's what my mom used to do. Go ask great grandma. <laughs> and went to great grandma and great grandma, you know, great grandma, who's now 95, why do you cut the bone off the ham before you bake it? And she says, because it wouldn't fit in the pan. <laughs> so what happens is these, these uh, urban myths get passed down from generation yeah. to generation. Like, for instance, I did a, uh, uh, I grew up in a family where you wet the toothbrush, brush your teeth, turn off the water, brush your teeth. I mean, now I just keep the water running and, you know, and whatever, but. Or like turning, time, off the, turning off the shower while you lather up rather well, than yeah, yeah. the outside of the stream, right? Yeah, yeah, and that was, that was a big, uh, that was a big thing in the 70s with the, with the gas crisis. Yeah. And, and I'll never forget, you know, but nobody in my family ever became wealthy. I'm infinitely wealthier than any of the penny pinchers that came before me. Mm -hmm. I, I'll never forget my father. God bless him. He's, he is still alive, but he says, whenever I needed more money, I just took another job. And so he, my father always traded time for money his entire yes. life. So oh, literally, gosh. you perform a service, you get money. You perform a service, you get money. The more services you perform, the more money you get. But you can work your fingers to the bone and be a hunched over, you know, old man with gnarly old hands because you traded time for money. 
your entire life, and then you pass that 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 is now called a work ethic. That George and, and it's and it's written in stone. And how dare you question it? Yeah. And like for instance, I woke up this morning and I checked out my statistics on my affiliate accounts. I made more money overnight this past night than I did during the day yesterday. I made money while I slept. Now my father can't fathom making money while you sleep. Can't fathom that. Yeah. His way, his way of wealth was turn off the water, turn off the light when you leave the room, you know, close the door in the winter time, put on an extra sweater. You know, that, that George, I think thing. it's I think it's a bit of both from from my side. I think I looked I look at it as ins and outs. And you know, if you've got a a problem with alcohol or a problem with, you know, whatever it is that's costing you a lot of money, um, then your outs is, is a problem. And if you're, if you're not able to earn a lot of money because, you, you know, you're, you're incapable or you're lazy or whatever, then your ins are, you know. And so I agree with your, with your uh, you can't become rich through scrimping, but I think it's, it's sort of, I always find it weird that the lessons come from the people that take the lessons, which is really weird. So you get a um, very scrimpy family talking and, and, doing very well with like saving but they're the people who need to save the least and the people who need to save the most are the last people to take the advice so it's it's yeah it's a bit of a, a, it, we're sort of you know how Carl Jung says you know what you most need is will be found where you least want to look that's sort of like the advice that you most need will be the one you're last willing to listen to something like that George yeah, uh, um, George the um the your thing about trading time for money you're, 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 you are like singing my choir presentation. You're preaching my tune, everything. You know, I'll mix some metaphors. Um, so I've been saying, I've, I tell people this all the time. I said, the last time I ever traded time for money was when I quit Sun Microsystems in 1992. I have never once traded. I, and here's the thing. Here I, I do two things. I said I said you want to be you want to be time independent, number one, and strive for geographical independence. I yes. said the other thing I don't do is 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 typically have to be at a specific time and place um, to to make money. Right? I have I have stuff online. I have. Um, you know, in, ten, in, in addition to my, you know, online activity, some affiliate kinds of stuff, um, I have uh, some uh, vacation rentals. And, you know, those are, they're on the internet. The listings are on the internet. They're, they are 24-7. Are I can literally pick up my phone and just do click, send a quote, da-da-da-da-da. It comes in, goes to my credit card. And I just made, like, my rentals typically are, like, two to four thousand a week you know so i make two to four thousand bucks in literally 15 seconds of time i don't even have to talk to them don't ever you know once it's booked the information all goes out to them automatically yeah. and all this stuff yeah the, the 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 other side of it is is you know it's it's kind of typical with businesses like that it's it's either it's either a, a, you know desert or a deluge so you know you'll go you have to be able to go a week or two or three weeks without a booking. But then you, then it's like, then it's like, bam, 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 bam. And you just made 10 yeah. or 50,000 in one day. Right? Yeah. So George, yeah. I've, got a, I've got a question for you, which is, uh, I ran a conference in 2013 and it was successful. And I was, uh, I was thinking of doing another one at some point. And I was going to, I was going to uh, do it where the speakers come and talk about what they've been working on recently. So they don't have a title created by me that it doesn't have a structure it's just they'll talk about what they've been working on and i've had i've been really busy so i haven't got that off the ground but noah's doing something in portugal next year noah riboy and I'm, we'd love to have you in terms of I, i'm helping him do it um but what are you doing at the moment what are you working on at the moment i am uh working towards <clears throat> geographic independence uh, I am not interested in going to a job. I quit my full-time job about a year and a half ago. Um, three years ago, 
I set what I call a PID, a personal independence day. And I gave myself 18 months to be independent from a job. And I reached that goal. And I became a full-time YouTuber content creator, complete with affiliate programs. Was doing quite well, making over six figures. And then the adpocalypse came with YouTube. And literally, my income was cut by 75% mm -hmm. because of some of my content. What that, what that had me do uh, was I had to literally go back, go back to work part-time and trade time for money again, which I've been doing for the past couple months. So what I'm working on now is creating online courses that are evergreen, uh, that are my sweet spots that will be selling for me 24-7, 365 days a year. And so that's actually, that's what I was working on at uh, 6 a.m. this morning and creating courses. And on my own hosting platform, I was going to initially go on like Skillshare, Udemy, or Teachable. But, you know, those courses are 1099, 1299, and you only get half of that. And then they determine whether there's going to be a sale. And you're, you're lucky if you're making three to four dollars a course, which is, you know, you have to have between 20 and 40 courses out there to make, to be lucky to be making a hundred thousand a year. So I'm working on courses that I will be hosting on my own platform and be doing email marketing. And that's what I can do. Uh, that way I'm not, anchored to Philadelphia. Yeah. I can go where I want to go. Uh, for instance, I will be uh, going to the, the 21 convention in October next month. That, for instance, if I was working a job, and I usually go there a few days ahead of time and stay after a few days. So that's literally, there's about eight day, eight, nine days right there. In the trading time for money economy, I'm losing money by not working, but in the online course world, you're making email marketing, I'm making money. I wake up and yeah. I check my stats and that's what I'm working towards. My yeah. goal is to be able to, uh, like I said to my uh, brother who lives in uh, uh, central coastal Florida, lives on the beach. He says, I kind of miss the fall weather. I was telling him about the weather here. It's getting cool in the evenings now, like sweat, you have to put on a sweatshirt now. It's, it's yeah. getting cool. So he says, man, he says, I really miss kind of like the fall weather and the winter and fireplaces and all that. And he says, but I just, he goes, ah, maybe someday I'll end up leaving the beach. And I said, why can't you have both? Why, why is it either or? I said, that's dad kicking in. You can't have it all. You know, you got to make it, make a choice, stick with it you know, suck, suck it up because only the rich people get to live in two different places uh, during different seasons. And he said, you know, you're right. He says, that's the old programming kicking in. I want to live on a boat part of the year. That's what I want to do. I want to live on a boat. I want to live my, I want my residence to be at a marina. And if I want to go fishing for the day, I can. If I want to go out somewhere and just drop anchor, and study, I can do that. If I want to have a party on the boat, I can do that. If I want to go swimming, I can do that. If I want to go snorkeling, I can do that. And work a few hours. I have found by doing online work, my online work keeps paying me over and over. Whereas my haircutting, which I love, I'm not complaining about my trade. There's only so much I can make yeah. while cutting hair. Yeah. So at this ripe young age, I am literally making a pivot in the next six months to be 95% independent yeah. of an employer. You know, I, I, I know, I know some uh, high powered lawyers. I, I have a cousin, right, the down in LA area um, who does complex business litigation. He commands $750 an hour but he has to put in the hour, 
right? He's got to be there. Yeah. He's, a, he's a partner at a firm. So, you know, you make all kinds of money off the associates hours as, as well, but it's still a fundamentally time yeah. for, for money business. Um, <clears throat> you know, so you can't really, you can't really create an app, the, for for legal services, uh, unless it's the do it yourself, fill out forms uh, right. sort of thing. And George, w w Andy, and I were chatting before you came on. It's it's interesting how at this point we get back to something I was talking to him about. I'm in the process of selling my home, and hopefully within a month or so, uh, we'll be we'll be going full nomad. I'm 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 liter I'm selling it fully furnished as a kind of a vacation. It used to be a vacation rental very well performing one. And uh, so it's going to be turnkey for somebody. I'm basically, you know, t hauling out, you know, some, some photo albums and a couple duffel bags worth of clothes and throwing them in the back of my car and I'm, I'm out of here. Right. But uh, so I've been doing a lot of research and, and having lived abroad in eight, both Asia and in Europe for a total of eight years, um, I'm, I'm pretty good at getting around and, and, and uh, going yeah strange place so i've been doing there's a there's a um an app or a, a website called nomadlist.com and it's a it's a wiki style database where it's like nomads living all over the world pumping in the data so you can do all this research and including what the cost of living is and there's like play, there's like great places that you can go where you can rent a, a nice a studio or one bedroom on a, on a short term, you know, two, three, four months, six months kind of thing. Great internet, air conditioning if you need it. You know, great cafes and, and restaurants and food carts nearby where the total cost of living is like $1,000 a month. Now, if you can generate even just three, say three to 5000 a month via internet activities, which is doable if you create some content and, and so on and you find different ways to channel it out, have some affiliate arrangements and, and whatnot. Um, you're actually banking money, which is giving you, so it's not really, so you're actually, so in a sense, yes, you're doing your, your, your living below your means, right? But you're not pinching. You're just going to a place where the coffee is five cents instead of three dollars, right? Yes. It's probably better. Right. So you could do this and live per in perpetuity, you know, according to Vitsa requirements, you go from one great place to the other all over the world. And cause there's tons of them. You wouldn't believe how many there are. Uh, I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'm highly considering uh, Vietnam as my first place. It's the hop in place right now. And I could be banking just on, just based on my internet stuff and the average of what I do and in, in, um, in uh, my vacation rentals, I'm actually going to sell two of my contracts because I just I'm not going to need to to put in the time and and service the debt on them and stuff like that. And so uh, I'm going to be able, I'm going to be banking a few thousand bucks a month, you know, even living arguably a better lifestyle than I live right up here because you got the beach and you've got the the, the, the you've got everything going on and you can you can travel here and travel there and Richard, I, I, what i call this what i call this is like the, the passive income model so who we had on last time ed towns my best school friend he he and i just when we were teenagers we just created this sort of this passive income model the idea of you know freeing up all your time we obviously didn't know that the capabilities we'd have now that you're both making um use of um would be around but yeah just the idea that if you free all your time up through earning while you're doing nothing like I am, like George is, like all of us are doing now, then you can learn, you can spend your time interacting with people and not just, oh, having fun, getting drunk, things like that, but actually learning how to improve those passive ways. So eventually the only things you're doing are having meetings with people that you're trading with, or obviously, you know, phone meetings or however that is, and strategizing about how to increase your own passive income. And it becomes a sort of a very detached process we're all at different stages for different reasons and it's it's sort of the way forward it's especially the way forward for people who are uh, ambitious i'd say it just makes more sense to be able to have your mm -hmm. own time of working you know trading time for money as you say you know i i know a guy that was trading time for money as a personal trainer 
and I think he was getting somewhere between forty and eighty dollars an hour to train people. And I've experienced things like this where uh, traffic gets backed up, and you're an hour late, and you miss a client. Well, you just missed eighty bucks. A client gets sick. They can't come in. You just lost 80 bucks. They're doing construction on the road and you have to park a half mile away from your place of employment. That keeps new business from coming to you. There's a snowstorm. The place is closed. You just lost a bunch of money. All these things come in, be in between you and money. So you have to create a life where, where nothing can and come in between you and money. So this person took what they already know, and that was how to train people, <laughs> and created a course uh, about arms, building strong arms. Did a course on building shoulders. Literally, they released their program, I believe it was $29 cheap for the e-course world. First weekend, first weekend it was released, they sold a thousand courses. They made $29,000 their first weekend. Second weekend, not as much. Third weekend, not as much. But it still continues to bring in money. So then they, de they developed another course revolving around another body part that they're very, very competent in training people on. So now, and that was $44. Same story all over again. So what they're doing now is this person is just making courses and checking his bank account every morning. Uh, there was a, a guy who wanted chickens, chickens that lay, that lay eggs. And so he built a chicken coop and the Foxes came literally and like ate all the chickens. And he said, I guess I didn't do a good enough job building my chicken coop. So he rebuilt it so predators couldn't get into it and uh, grew his chicken operation, still had a full time job, and enjoyed raising chickens and selling eggs. So he built another chicken coop and another, and then eventually um, they put out an e-course called, they bought the domain chickencoopplans.com mm -hmm. and there's 10 very detailed step-by-step -step plans for building chicken coops. First year in the business, $200,000, $200,000. And, and growing, and growing. Chickencoopplans.com. Uh, there was a lady in an abusive relationship. Uh, gosh, I forget her name. She was interviewed by Phil Ebner on, um, he's kind of like a, uh, a Udemy guy. Um, and he's on YouTube. And I listened to her interview. And she was always supported by a husband didn't go to college. She felt like she had no skills. And she was always afraid to leave this relationship because literally that person put a roof over her head and whatever. And she ended up like in a shelter or something like that. And somebody was talking to her and she kept telling them what she can't do. And the person just cut her off and said, what can you do? She says, I can bake bread. She could, she was, her self-esteem was so low. The only thing she could think of was I can bake bread. Person said, what kind of bread? She goes, I'm really good at sourdough bread. Okay. She put a course online, sourdough bread. $83,000 her first year, $300,000 her second year, and it's growing. So now all she does is create sourdough recipes. And She's a genius. So where do you start? What do you already know? You don't, like, I, I, it kills me when my friend said, I'm going to go back to school and get a master's degree. I'm like, for what? 
You know, I'm going to go back and get my PhD. For what? What, to go into debt? You know, you're going to feel even more ripped off because you're going to be super qualified, but you still won't be making any more money. What do you currently know how to do that people will give you money for? And most likely, the things that you think people won't give you money for, that's where you're going to make your money. Your money. The, um, it's... I, I, you know, I, I, I always tell people, you know, except in rare instances, like for like STEM degrees, you know, medical surgeon, stuff like that. Tell people, you know, don't go to college, get a job or start a business. You're, 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 you're way ahead, five years down the road. You're way ahead of your peers who went into student debt, right? Probably. 80, 90% of what they learned is completely useless, right? And if you want an education, you just Google, right? There's tons of instru there's there's tons of stuff out there for free covering almost everything. And then there's, you know, Khan Academy and and um, and all these other outlets. And it's like, it, what is the incentive? What is the thing of like, of like, oh, you know, I just I paid two hundred fifty thousand for a master's or a PhD. What do you think and about online money? universities, Richard uh, and and George as well? Like Jordan Peterson's doing this. Uh, it's like called something dot. It's a stupid name, but um, yeah, online universities where the only thing you have to pay for is the exam fee. I think it's I think it's the way forward, but who knows? Yeah, it's, it's just a no brainer to me, right? I, it's funny, you know, if I if I want to do some um, do like if I have a car problem. Right. It's not like uh, like the cars, you know, the 60s and 70s cars you used to work on when you were a, when you were a, a teenager, George, or and, and Andy was like in diapers. But um, <laughs> the it's it's amazing. Uh, I can go. It's you know, some of the problems are fairly complex. But I'll go and, like to Pinterest or YouTube. I just like BMW X5, blah, 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 blah. And boom. There's a video that addresses it, and wham, it's a, it's a quick, easy fix, typically. Or if it's not, at least it's way less costly. I've saved myself hundreds of dollars uh, doing that. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. So um, I guess we should, we should wrap up. Any last advice, George? How about this? How about you? So say a guy, you know, He's a couch potato, gamer, slob, coke drinker, mommy's basement dwelling wanker, bedwetter. And he says, he says, I wanna, I want to, I wanna fix fix my life in terms of like grooming, dress, poise. Of course he can't make results overnight. But what's the first what is what is what are you gonna tell him? What are the first three or five things that you're gonna do? Start doing right now, today. What are you going to do? I like the idea of um, just getting getting the visual, getting the optics taken care of. Get the haircut. Pay the money. Get the haircut. Buy clothes that are fitted. People are going to size you up in three to six seconds. It doesn't matter who you are. People sized you up immediately. So look the part. Don't give people a reason to not listen to you. You're going to make more money with your ideas than with your, with your hands. Uh, have mental skills uh, versus uh, a trade skill. Although I come from a family where my grandfather said, always have something you can do with your hands. And I did. I cut hair for a living. That's, that's a trade. I can go anywhere in the country drop me off with a parachute any anywhere in the country and by the end of the day i'll be working somewhere because i have a trade that's kind of the neat thing about having a trade but the reality is many times there is a ceiling you know there's the, there's the hierarchy of uh, man at work men at work and money at work and you want to get to the point where your money is working for you not just you working for you. You want to get away from just trading time for money. If you want to get a piece of what other people are making, that's the men at work model. But the ultimate 
model of income and changing your life is money at work, having your money work for you. I think that's super important. And we're not taught that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, something beyond uh, just a passbook savings account. Or yeah, I might just add to that one thing, Richard, which is sure. just like anyone who's doing this, like it's, it's for me, it's two things at once. It's like take all the advice, listen to all the things George and Richard and I and everyone says, but at the same time, you've got to go for yourself. You've got to say, okay, I like that idea. I'm going to test it. Not I'm just going to blindly follow this man or woman's uh, modest vivendi, their entire way of being. And so for me, I I've felt like I've made the most progress when I've just gone out and said, oh, I really like that five minute spiel from this person. I'm going to try and do that for X amount of weeks. And then you, you get the feedback, whether it's, you know, a stupid diet or a way of living, or I now get up at the same time every morning. I think it's helped. Who knows? So I'd always say just keep testing because people always say, oh, what's the answer? Like, how do you get here? How do you succeed? And it's sort of like, ah, yeah. you're asking someone else to, to do what you've got to do so they can, they can, you know, the old, you can lead a horse to water, but don't make it drink that kind of thing. And, and that's for me, the biggest thing is allowing the person to realize they've got their own agency and they need to train that agency into themselves. Mm -hmm. Train your agency. Yeah. The, uh, so it's two, two ideas, you know, every experiment is a, is a success because you either, you either falsified something or, uh, con or uh, supported it enough to continue to do it and continue yeah. to approve, which also goes to so testing, but also being more being gradually. It's hard to do it at first until you could develop a little sophistication, but you can A B test almost anything, right? So you have this approach, and maybe it's modified a little bit here, and whichever one produces the best results, assuming that you're going to get results worthy of carrying on, whichever one. Uh, produces the best results that becomes your new your new you know benchmark a and then you develop a little slightly different thing for b and it's a continual process of improvement mm -hmm. where you're actually testing you know specifically defined things against one another so george you want to wrap it up well, uh, george it was it was really great to chat to you on here um we'd love to have you back and hopefully next year we'll we'll talk about a conference and maybe have you speak if around yeah i would love to i my answer for speaking engagements is always yes it, okay. i never well, have to think nice. about that yeah okay so gentlemen please uh, i'm gonna um stop the recording now and please stay on because i have a couple of admin issues to cover thanks everyone for listening george andy as always but i'll i'll, uh, I'll talk Pleasure. to you in a second